My name is Darnisha Allen, and I have the uh, honor and luxury of introducing many of our speakers this morning. We want to take the time to embrace you and welcome you into this event on our first full day. Um, I want to introduce our uh, opening speaker for our tribal welcome. Please help me as we extend our hellos and our welcome to Marla Noni. She is a Comanche language and culture curriculum specialist at the Comanche Academy. She's an accomplished and per accomplished performing and recording artist from Seneca, Comanche, and Huron band Potawatomi Nations. Good morning. Thank you, Darnisha. On behalf of Comanche, Seneca, Huron Band, Potawatomi Nations, I want to welcome you to this, to this conference and wanted to share a, a, um, a tribal morning blessing song with you. But first, I want to um, introduce myself a, a little bit more in a, in a tribal sense. My name is Marla Noni. My families are the Nonis, the White Pigeons, the Pierces. All of these people that have come before me have made me for this purpose. My purpose is for God only, my Creator. And it's important that what I share with you today is that you listen with an open heart. For what I'm going to share with you is meant for the spirit. And I ask that you listen with an open heart. It's for the ear too, but it's mostly for your spirit. And I pray that each and every one of you are blessed from this Comanche blessing song. How's that? Awesome. Thank you, Marla, for setting the stage for a truly cup-filling experience. And I hope that you guys can carry that throughout this entire Cross Sites journey. Um, I just want to note that our theme is rooted in, and the reason why we asked Marla to join us is because we wanted to center ourselves, recenter ourselves, and what we're rooted in that drives this work that keeps us connected, that holds us even in the hardest moments. And I hope that that sets the stage for you so that you feel charged by the time that you leave here. You feel connected to other roots growing in the same tree 
as we experience this work and that you hold that as the threshold for opening the door for everything else that you will get across the span of this cross site experience. I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker for welcoming us into this space, and it is our federal project officer, Katerina. And she's gonna come up and share um, some information and a message uh, for you from our federal project officers. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Save Babies and Infant Toddler Court Champions. Good morning, Champions for Young Children and their families. I am so excited to be here this morning and see so many of you who have traveled from close and far to be in this space with one another. It's such a pleasure. It's about eight in the morning on day two, and I have already learned so much from you all. We have such wealth of experience and expertise, such a diversity of experience and expertise in this room. Over 500 of you, and each one of you has a story to tell and knowledge to share. So thank you for being here. As Darnisha has said, I serve as the Federal Project Officer for the Infant Toddler Court Program within the Health Resources and Services Administration. And it's been my honor to be working with our National Research Center, operated by 023, as well as the state ORDs. At HRSA, we are committed to the health and well-being of children and families. And the work that you do is in very close alignment with the public health priorities and best practices our agency advances and espouses. And this is what Dr. Warren will share in his welcome message. He could not be here today, but he was very excited to share opening remarks for this meeting. Dr. Michael Warren is the Associate Administrator of the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. Good morning. I'm Dr. Not yet, Dr. Warren. <laughs> we have a bio to share first. <laughs> the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, also known as MCHB because we love acronyms, which is part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Services Administration. I prefer to say HRSA because that's easier. Our programs reach more than 60 million people, including 99% of infants, 93% of pregnant women, and 62% of children, including children with special health care needs. Before assuming his current role, Dr. Warren served in various leadership roles at the Tennessee Department of Health, including being the Title V Director and Deputy Commissioner for Population Health. He's also a board-certified pediatrician. So as you know, we have a video of Dr. Warren's remarks to welcome you this morning, and thank you again for being here. Good morning. I'm Dr. Michael Warren, Associate Administrator of the Maternal and Child Health Bureau at the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA. So glad to be able to join you virtually for this Infant Toddler Court um, cross sites Annual Meeting. Uh, you all are doing such tremendous work that is reaching children and families across the country, uh, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity uh, to join you for a few minutes at the start of your uh, presentation. As you all know, at the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, we have a strategic plan focused on four key goals. Those are access, equity, capacity, and impact. The work that you all do through the Infant Toddler Court Program supports all of those goals. You are bringing access to services to children and families who may have not had that access or who may have had difficulty accessing services. You're connecting them with a variety of support services within their community. Those may be health services, such as primary care, or those may be other social supports uh, within the community that may help that family uh, achieve optimal health and well-being. From the standpoint of equity, you're reaching communities that have been disproportionately uh, engaged in the child welfare system uh, and that have a disproportionate lack of opportunity in their communities. You are helping uh, to change the way that systems work and to change the way that we think about the approach to child welfare and engagement with the judicial system. And then finally, in terms of capacity, 
you're working with leaders across your communities and your states to help transform the way that they think about early childhood and the needs of families with young children. You're helping them to think about what it takes for those children and families to be able to thrive in those communities and how to design systems that actually assure that those children and families are going to be able to thrive. It's been a really exciting time when we think about the last few years of this program. We've seen substantial growth. Just four years ago, we were in a position four or five years ago um, where the funding was much less. Back in fiscal year 2018, this program was funded at $3 million. Um, that has increased over time, and we are now being funded annually at $18 million. What that means is we've got funding to support 12 states directly uh, to stand up state programs to be able to implement the infant toddler court approach across their state. And then the National Resource Center exists to support all states. So even those states that aren't funded uh, have the ability to come to the National Center to get technical assistance and support. So we really have the opportunity to be able to spread this and have the reach of a nationwide program. In terms of the ways that you all support family health and well-being, uh, first and foremost, you're taking a public health approach to safety and security and well-being. When we talk about a public health approach, we mean we're really looking broadly at the factors that influence outcomes, and we're thinking about the opportunities we have to engage communities and people with lived experience in changing the way that systems work to get us better outcomes. You're taking a look at the prenatal to three period. You're recognizing that in order to have better outcomes for babies and young children, we've got to have better outcomes uh, for that family, even during the prenatal period. And how do we support that family unit during pregnancy to be able to optimize outcomes for both mom and baby, both immediately around the time of birth, but also setting them up on a trajectory to have optimal health and well-being throughout those early years. You're taking necessarily a two-generational approach, recognizing uh, that the outcomes for kids really, again, rely on the circumstances of their parents and the circumstances they're facing in their communities. You're thinking that you can't address the health and well-being of a child alone without also thinking about the health and well-being of their parent. And you really embody this two-generational approach. And lastly, you're really thinking about health promotion and prevention. Uh, we know from prior program evaluations that for families that interact with infant toddler courts, you do a tremendous job of making sure they're connected with primary care and getting well child visits, for example. We know those visits are so important to be able to not only follow up on the physical health and well-being of that child, but also it's a great opportunity to provide anticipatory guidance and education uh, to families with young children and to identify needs and connect them with necessary resources in the community. The work that you all are doing also aligns so beautifully with other HRSA investments. For example, in the space of early childhood, we have the Maternal, Infant, and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program. We know that home visiting is based on decades of evidence uh, that's shown that when you send an early childhood worker, a social worker, or a nurse, a uh, community health worker out to work with children and families, outcomes are better uh, for both that child and that family. And that includes things like preventing child abuse and neglect. We also have early childhood comprehensive systems programs that work to change systems at the states to be more aligned and to better support the needs of families with young children and to make those important connections between health and social services and child welfare programs. The introduction of the ITC program really has created an, a new opportunity for us to think about how to bring child welfare and the judicial system into the space where they hadn't been as intimately connected before. We also have a growing number of investments in the behavioral health space at HRSA. Behavioral health is a major challenge, whether we're talking about child health or maternal health. We know there are substantial issues with accessing behavioral health services across the country. And so we've got programs like our brand new National Maternal Mental Health Hotline. We launched this on Mother's Day in 2022. We've received over 40,000 calls to date. The most common reasons that folks call that line are feeling anxious, overwhelmed, or depressed. And we know that this really is a vital resource for folks in communities across the country where they may not have access to other behavioral health services. That hotline is available 24-7. Uh, folks can call or text, and the number is 
TLC Mama. I hope that if you don't already know about that line, you'll take the opportunity to jot that number down and think about how you can incorporate that into your programming. Again, one eight three three tlc mama We're also working to make sure that in primary care settings across the country, primary care providers have access to be able to reach specialists to ask questions about patients who may be in front of them, who may be having behavioral health concerns. So in almost every state across the country, we have a pediatric mental health teleconsultation service. And in 13 states across the country, we now have that service available for maternal health providers. I think about this like phone a friend, a primary care provider has someone in front of them in clinic. They've got a question about, uh, about a diagnosis or about management. They can pick up the phone, call that teleconsultation line and be able to get real time or near real time advice on how to respond to that patient. It's another way that we're helping to break down some of those barriers to access to behavioral health services across the country. As we think about the work that you all do, we know there is tremendous opportunity to align with the work that's being done in health care systems. Um, we know, for example, that many of you have already engaged with uh, hospitals to think about plans of safe care or to be able to train providers uh, to understand resources that are available to them in communities and to train them on trauma-informed approaches as they're caring for families who may be at risk for entering uh, the child welfare system. Uh, we also know that many of you have partnered with state AAP chapters to be able to move this work forward. And so we'd encourage you to think about continuing um, that really aligned work on behalf of kids and families. We know that you all have also been involved in the Medicaid redetermination work. Health insurance is so important. Uh, and when families have access to health insurance, it really makes it so much easier for them to achieve optimal health and well-being uh, for their child and their overall family. Um, as the COVID pandemic uh, came to an end and uh, some of the special provisions that had been in place around Medicaid redetermination as those provisions came to an end, there was a great need and still is a great need to be able to connect families to services that they are eligible for. And so I would encourage you to continue to think about how you uh, focus on this work. We know that infant toddler court programs have reached over 5,000 families across the country already and helping to make them aware of how to connect with uh, Medicaid and other insurance for which they may be uh, eligible. And so we would ask that you continue to do that vital work moving forward. As we look ahead to the future of this program, uh, I hope you'll think about opportunities to continue to expand your partnership and reach, whether that's through state early childhood comprehensive systems work that we fund, whether that's through our early childhood advisory councils or governor's councils focused on early childhood, please make sure you are at that table. If you're not at that table, figure out a way to get yourself invited. So many times we've focused on early intervention services and primary care services, and the child welfare system may or may not have been at the table, the judicial system may or may not have been at the table, but you play a vital role in optimal outcomes for these families. And so it's important that you be at the table and that you start to change the way that people think. That's what I mean by the second bullet of bring this approach to all who need it. We want to make sure that folks who are at those decision making tables, at those tables that are setting the agenda and the, the plan for work that's going to be done in states and communities, that you all are there and you're thinking about this two generational multidisciplinary approach to really helping families succeed. We also want you to look across your states and communities and expand this approach uh, to other parts of your states or communities that may need this work. Use data to understand where there may be particularly challenging spots in your states, uh, where you may be seeing overrepresentation, for example, uh, in the judicial system, and where there are opportunities to really think about ways to bring this infant toddler court approach to those communities. Uh, we know that in communities where this has been implemented, uh, that there is such strong support from our partners in the judicial system, and we want to think about how we spread that to communities all across the country. And then finally, I would ask that you continue to elevate the voices of families and children. Uh, for our partners who are part of the Infant Toddler Court Program, sometimes you see families when they're at their, their worst, in their most challenging moments, um, when they are presenting to you when the system hasn't worked for them. Um, and you see also through the Infant Toddler Court Program how the work that you do can be transformative for those families when we're all rowing in the same direction, when we've got the opportunity to think about 
wrapping around those families with services and supports to change that trajectory for them, that can just be tremendous for families. Um, and so we want you to continue to think about how you share those experiences uh, and how well that approach is working to partners all across the state to be able to really expand this approach, again, to all of those who need it. Uh, I want to close by thanking you for your time. I'm so glad you're able to come together and reflect on the successes that you've had to date and to learn from each other about what's working well in other states and to think about how you might continue to move this work forward. We at HRSA are so excited to be able to support this work, and I want to thank you for your partnership and look forward to our many successes together moving forward. Thank you. We thank HRSA for supporting us in this work and lifting us to move forward and opening new doors and traveling down pathways that we had previously only dreamed of. And we have so much gratitude for the way you all have embraced us in this work to carry us forward and to support you and what you're doing. I now have the honor of introducing you to, if you haven't met him before, I refuse to believe that's possible. But introducing you to one of the greatest champions for babies that we have ever known. And not only is he a great champion for babies, but he is the strongest advocate for safe babies that we have ever had. And we exist because of his energy and his efforts. I give you Matthew Melmet, our executive director of Zero to Three. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think that we exist because of the work that each and every one of you do. And I have to say that it is just the realization of uh, a dream to just see so many of you here, to see the trajectory of growth Dr. Warren referred to, and um, to see the real impact that we're having on the lives of, of babies and toddlers and their families. Uh, it's really inspiring uh, to stand before you, uh, a national convening of caring adults committed to the well-being of young children, to talk about what's working and spark further momentum to give babies and toddlers a strong start in life. This meeting, as you know, is co-sponsored by Zero to Three and the Infant Toddler Court Program that is supported and funded through HRSA. And I want to express my deepest gratitude to our partners at HRSA for their continued commitment, support, passion, and compassion for doing right by babies. And I really want to thank Katerina and Dr. Warren. I thought his remarks were really comprehensive and placed the work that we're doing within a public health model, thinking about this from a systemic way. This year's theme, Rooted In, perfectly illustrates the impact of the Safe Babies approach. Supporting young children's development is like tending a garden. Just as a garden needs fertile soil, water, and sunlight to thrive, a baby's brain requires nurturing, positive experiences, and responsive caregiving in order to flourish. How and how well we think, we learn, we control our emotions, we relate to others the rest of our lives, in short, everything that makes us human is heavily dependent on the nature of the experiences and relationships that we have in our earliest days and months and years. And for 18 years, 18 years, Zero to Three Safe Babies program has prioritized relationships, mental health, science, equity, parent voice, and compassion in child welfare. The first three years of life are critical for brain development, 
It shapes cognitive abilities, emotional well-being, and social skills. Early positive experiences lay the groundwork for lifelong success. But let's consider, every seven minutes, a baby in this country is removed from their parents because of alleged abuse or neglect. Every seven minutes. In fact, 33% of children who enter the child welfare system are under the age of three. 33%, more than any other age group. These are foundational years, and we don't get a do-over. We need to do everything in our power to protect these babies and toddlers and keep them on a developmentally appropriate trajectory. Last month, the Biden and Harris administration announced new child welfare policies designed to prevent family separation when safely possible. These policies aim to connect families to community and economic resources to prevent family separations based solely on financial hardship. I mention these policies because they align with our vision to support and strengthen families, which puts babies and toddlers on the path to healthy developmental outcomes. Let's consider a few of these important pathways. When it comes to babies, we know every moment matters. Babies are entirely dependent on their caregivers, making them extremely vulnerable to adversity and instability. Adverse early childhood experiences can disrupt early brain development and hinder mental health, leading to lifelong debilitating outcomes such as higher rates of heart disease, depression, and even lower life expectancy. Looking at child maltreatment as preventable and solvable, we can more clearly see the role we have in shaping healthier, safer outcomes for these babies. Our experience shows that early identification and support for families can prevent neglect and abuse. The child welfare system often prioritizes the physical safety of children over their psychological and emotional needs, which can feel less urgent or unseen or untangible when a family is in the throes of a crisis. Safe Babies fills a critical role in helping communities balance both these needs, physical and emotional safety, so babies and families can heal and they can thrive. This means supporting families as early as possible. Families often face numerous challenges simultaneously, such as mental health issues and financial instability. Reaching out to these families and guiding them to the right resources promotes family stability and well-being. It is encouraging to see states like California New York and Colorado, implementing a mandatory supporting policy, rather just mandated reporting. Supporting, rather than just mandated supporting. These policy shifts prioritize supporting families and connecting them to resources, rather than assuming neglect or abuse and filing a CPS report. This gives families the best chance to thrive together and prevents the disruption and trauma associated with babies being shuffled through the child welfare system from one home to another home, wondering what was going on in their world. These innovations stand the best chance of succeeding when we pool our resources, time, and effort. It's not enough just to acknowledge the silos that exist within early childhood systems. We must break through them and build better bridges between them. Through cross-disciplinary collaboration, 
we can create cohesive and comprehensive approaches. With coordinated local, state, and federal policies, we can help more families address overlapping needs, such as health, education, economic stability, and social services. We can integrate systems to avoid gaps in services, making it easier for families to avoid unnecessary barriers or delays. We must be flexible and responsive to enable families to get the support and resources they need in a way that is best for them. These include providing culturally relevant services, adjusting to changes in family circumstances, and ensuring that support is personalized and accessible. Zero to Three and the Safe Babies program are committed to co-creating systems alongside parents and caregivers who have first-hand experience and navigating the very systems we aim to improve. We recognize parents as equal partners in this journey. By elevating their voices, we ensure our work is informed by those who best understand their needs and challenges. Their lived experience helps us to identify blind spots and co-create innovative solutions that reflect what families know they need in order to succeed. I would like to recognize the parent leaders, mentors, and partners, all members of our National Advisory Group for Parents' Voices who are here with us today for their voice, their strength, and their invaluable trust in our work. Thank you for all the work that you are doing. We, together, are not just transforming a system. We are co-creating a shared vision for a system that is more responsive, equitable, and effective. This all comes down to coordinating public policy and investing in support and education for parents. By advocating for policies that provide holistic support, such as universal childcare, mental health services, and expanded child tax credit and financial assistance, like covering transportation or housing su subsidies, we can help ensure that no family takes this journey alone. Before I close, I want to recognize some important policy wins that give us hope and affirmation that the work we're doing together is having an impact. In Georgia, thanks, anyone here from Georgia? Yeah, I saw you, yes. In Georgia, thanks to the leadership of the Georgia Early Education Alliance for Ready Students, or called GEARS, proposed legislation for the next session of the state legislature will redefine outcomes through more frequent family time and court hearings and increased access to infant mental health and early intervention services. And a legislative task force also recommends implementing and sustaining safe babies statewide. In Ohio, a collaboration led by the Groundwork Ohio and the State Medicaid Agency has found new ways to promote infant and early childhood mental health through proposed legislation. In Washington State, they're providing access to quality early learning programs to help reduce the likelihood of child welfare system invol involvement. And in a really powerful show of support for children's mental health at the federal level, the Administration for Children and Families has recently released three informational memoranda providing guidance for states on how to partner with Safe Babies teams. As we gather here today, with representatives from 33 states. I am really filled with hope and inspiration. Your commitment to the well-being of babies, toddlers, and their families is a testament to the power of collaboration and shared purpose in changing not just systems, but lives. Thank you, sincerely thank you for all you're doing and from working with us to make sure that every baby has a strong start in life. Thank you.
Now, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Chandra Gosh Ippen, a child trauma psychologist with more than 30 years experience, and I'm proud to say a member of the board of directors of Zero to Three, one of my 22 bosses. <laughs> trauma work, trauma work is undeniably difficult. Those who work, and you, those of you in this room that do this, know that you are profoundly affected. You bear witness to pain and shame. But within these experiences, you also find connection and resilience. As Associate Director of the Child Trauma Research Program at the University of California, San Francisco, and co-developer of child parent psychotherapy, Dr. Ippen has focused her career on supporting families and children under the age of six. She is also an acclaimed children's book author whose works including Trinka and Sam, that series, has reached over 400,000 families worldwide. Dr. Ippen has much to share about honoring the pain of trauma and the healing powers of resilience. So please give me, uh, give me a warm welcome to Dr. Chandra Gosh Ippen. Good morning. All right, so this is gonna be a little different. I thought what I would do today is that I would share my ABCs and three children's books. And let's see if this works. Because my reason for that is that I tried to take my last 30 years of experience, along with what I had learned about core concepts that are so important to our work. And these include concepts from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, as well as for CPP, and I tried to embed them into story in the hopes that through story and through metaphor, what would happen is that those concepts would shine. And that as they shined, more people to uptake them into our hearts, souls, and bodies so that we can use those lessons learned to transform the lives and experiences of the families that we deeply care for. So these are some of the stories, and I wanted to make sure that they're accessible, and also in sharing them, I did not want you to feel marketed to. So what you should know is that there's a program called Free on the First, and if you go on this website and click on the elephant, you will find out how you can get the stories freely available. There are also always free video versions on YouTube. And you should know that actually, I made the majority of them free today as well. So you're part of a select group. It's not really a secret, so please feel free to share. And um, except for Mama's Waves and Argo and me, I kind of messed up and it'll be free tomorrow. So I, I, <laughs> sorry, I was trying to get them all free today. But. So let me start with my ABCs. So these are what I would call the ABCs of a trauma-informed response. The A stands for acknowledge. And the freaked out little squirrel up there is standing under a gigantic wave to kind of think about what happens when we are surrounded by a wave of danger. Because trauma is essentially about danger. Danger where you felt stuck, where you felt like you couldn't do something, right? And so what we acknowledge is we acknowledge the danger that children have been through. We acknowledge the danger that their parents have been through. We acknowledge the danger that far too many cultural groups and communities have been through that often has not been acknowledged. And we also acknowledge what we as workers go through when we put ourselves you know, in proximity to danger as we hear these stories, as we take them in. And the B stands for the body. And if you think about the words of Bessel van der Kolk, he said, the body keeps the score. And I want us to think about how that is actually the wisdom of the body, because we are designed to remember danger. Because in evolutionary terms, remembering danger helps you survive. Because when your body remembers danger, if you run into it again, you will survive better. Does that make sense? But if we think about remembering danger, our bodies also remember love and healing. And so it's also important to remember that. And the C stands for connections. 
And the first connection that I'd like to draw for you comes from child-parent psychotherapy. And so I kind of joke and said that every other evidence-based model had a triangle, and so we wanted to be trendy too, just like everyone else, and so we needed to design our triangle. But let me just draw this for you. On the right-hand side of our triangle, we're going to put behavior and feelings. And think about how these are things that often bring us down, where you might say that the child is hitting or kicking or spitting, or that this parent is doing certain things that kind of really bug us. And on the left-hand side, what we're going to put is curiosity. Right? So we're going to start with kind of a big, huh, I wonder why that might be. And think of this on the left-hand side as a road. What is the road that the person traveled where this makes complete sense given what they went through, right? And that Samsa mantra of it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you, it's what you went through that brought you to this point. And this connection right here, I think of it as a bridge because you're, you're building a bridge of understanding. And then at the bottom of this, you're going to put what's our plan? And once you make that connection of, oh, this makes so much sense for yourself or for a person you care for, we actually make a much better plan. Now around this, we put protective steps and hope. Now we do this because we're looking to build connections. That with, that's what this is all about. And I think most of the world kind of unfortunately has it wrong. Because when we look at these little kids, what, what many people would say is they are too little to be affected. And we all know that when you look at these little kids, you would say, oh, they are so little that when things happen, it ruptures their sense of safety. And actually, it sets the template for what they believe things will be like. So if my grown-up has gotten angry and all hell is broken loose, that is what I expect in my body, right? Or if people have left me, boom, 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 and then somebody new comes into my life, what do I expect? I expect that you will leave me too, just even from the beginning. And so our team has a mantra of we speak the unspeakable, knowing that when little children have fears that are unrecognized, that it actually acts as a wedge between them and their loved ones. We think about how being able to A, acknowledge, actually brings the connection back together. And then of course, as we think about connections, all of us and recognizing a core principle from zero to three, that multidisciplinary and multi-system collaboration are necessary to provide effective support, which is why it's so important that all of us are here today and that you have meetings like this where we can gather and think together. Now, ABCs, I'm cheating a little bit because you know I wanted another letter, but if trauma is really about danger, the S stands for safety and protection, and that's what we're looking to restore is a sense of relational safety and protection. So I'm going to read you a children's story. It is also available in Spanish, and all of them are available freely today, except for Mama's Waves, which will be free tomorrow. The Spanish versions are also free. She's not coming, sighed Ellie. Doesn't look like it, agreed Miss Kay sadly. They had been here before, in the past, there were tears, slammed doors, ripped up and ripped up cards. Sometimes Ellie would let Miss Kay hold her while she cried, and other times she said horrible things she didn't really mean. But today, Ellie was quiet, stuck in a cloud of sadness and anger. Nothing Miss Kay did seemed to help, but she did them anyway. The next day, Miss Kay made a phone call, packed a thermos of chocolate milk, and told Ellie they were going to the beach. Ellie growled like a bear. I don't want to go to the beach. I don't want to go anywhere. Yep, said Miss Kay with a deep breath. I know how you feel, but I need a yelling partner, and you're it. A yelling partner, asked Ellie. Yep, said Miss Kay. I've got feelings stuck inside, and I need to yell them out. But so people won't think I'm strange, I thought I'd go into the beach and yell into the waves. They might still think you're strange, said Ellie. Maybe, said Miss Kay, but I'll feel a lot better. An hour later, they were at the beach with their feet in the waves. Ready, asked Miss Kay. Yep, said Ellie, and she began counting. One, two, three, aya! They yelled, sending their voices into the crashing waves. 
And then Ellie heard a familiar voice call her special name. Ellie Bean! She turned and saw Uncle Finn. Finny, she yelled. He wrapped her up in a big hug. Miss Kay said she needed yelling partners, so I came as soon as class finished. Can I yell too? Ellie nodded and began another countdown. After some good yelling time, they sank into the sand. I hear your mama didn't come again, said Finn. Ellie looked down. She didn't call or anything. Doesn't she care? Finn stared into the ocean. You see those waves? They remind me of your mom. When we were growing up, things were pretty stormy. Her boat got tossed around by waves until the waves became a part of her. We all have our wavy days, our highs and our lows, but your mama's waves go higher and lower than most, and sometimes they carry her away from the people she loves. Like you, asked Ellie. Yeah, replied Finn, and you. Do you think she's okay, whispered Ellie. I hope so, said Finn. She's battling waves, and she's got to get some help. I worry about her, said Ellie. Me too, said Finn. Oop. As the sand oozed through their fingers, Ellie and Finn shared Mama's stories. They remembered stormy days when Ellie was sad and scared, and smooth sailing days when Ellie felt so special. Oh, Finny, said Ellie, remember her rainbow cookies? Rainbow cookies, asked Miss Kay. Yep, said Finn, chocolate chip cookies with rainbow sprinkles. She called them Ellie Bean Specials. She said that when we ate them, we planted magic rainbows inside us, giggled Ellie. Miss Kay smiled. I knew you had magic inside you. Thank you for sharing your stories. Finny and I are here for, here for you. We want to hear about the tough days and the good ones. Your mom is dealing with big waves, but we won't let those waves wash away her magic and love. Ellie nodded, leaned closer, and together they watched as the sun sank into the sea and lit up the sky with a beautiful shimmering rainbow. So in many ways, I believe this is the story or part of the story of our work. Another part involves holding Ellie's parents in mind and, and working and partnering with them as well. But as you hear the, the story and hopefully feel the story, it can be hard to think clearly, but I want us to think about what concepts might guide us when we work with a family like Ellie's. And also, I really hope you see the hope in this. So I see the hope in that when I think about Ellie's triangle, and I think about all the things that Ellie's doing. You know, she's crying, she's not easily soothed, she's maybe destroying things, she's kicking doors. What the hope for me comes from the fact that Miss Kay, Finney, and all of us, what we're doing is we're going, of course, poor Peanut, right? Because what we know is what Ellie went through. We know that there she was waiting for someone she loves, feeling it in the pit of her stomach. And we know that actually, even as she's doing that, she's thinking things like, oh my goodness, I remember times when you were not okay. Maybe you're not here because you're not okay. Could it be that you're not okay? And then, or could it be that you don't care about me, right? And, and this is a little kid who is under the age of like four, she's three, and she's carrying all of this turbulence, and she's also remembering these beautiful moments, which is interesting because I think when you have that much turbulence inside, kind of flipping about, there are these moments where you're really great and I want to be with you. There are these moments that are scary and where, where are you? Our world does not give little kids credit for the fact that all of this is inside them. And so we often don't open the dialogue and what we do instead is we strand them with that story inside their bodies. And we know from the research that when you're stranded and alone with those stories, that it hurts your body. And if you listen to the story also, what you see here in terms of where I find hope is because what I learned is that when, when Miss Kay is holding Ellie, I think what she's really thinking is, you've been through so much. It's so hard, you might worry. And in essence, actually, what I often think that 
you know, some of the wise resource caregivers that I've partnered with or family members, they think, oh, peanut, right? It's like you're just a little peanut and you've been through so much. And what's interesting about that framework versus kind of looking at these behavior problems and thinking, oh my God, you know, you're quite a handful and whatnot, and why are you doing all of this? Why are you doing this? Is that what we know is that our attributions, our beliefs about somebody, totally affect the signals we send each other and the actions, right? And so what we, can, we know is that grown-ups' attributions are powerful shapers of children's development. That's a core concept. So oftentimes, people ask me to teach people skills, and I'm like, well, skills are very good, and fundamentally, what I believe about you changes my body. And so one of the metaphors that I like to use is the metaphor of a stop a stoplight, right? Where I think of, you know, between us are the signals that we're sending green, like proceed, all systems are go. Are they yellow? I'm not so sure, like proceed with caution. Or are they kind of red, danger, danger, stop? And I think that when we're holding a little kid and we're thinking, oh, you've been through so much, we're really actually wooing them back to safety. Does that make sense? We're wooing their neurobiology, we're wooing them relationally. And so the way that we hold Ellie's experience really transmits that love and care. And then, in the story, I hope you see the beautiful concept that is core to the field of infant mental health of being with, right? And as well as in the trauma field. And you see a child who, when she's going through this, the grown-ups are there, and the beauty of Miss Kay involving Finney, who is her uncle. And that Dan Siegel said, what is shareable is bearable, right? So a child who is not stranded with her experience. And then I love this idea of very simply how people open the door to children's story, that we essentially say, this can be spoken. You don't have to be alone with it. And what Miss Kay very simply says is we want to hear about the tough days and the good ones. We want you not to be alone with this. And that is, in essence, a lot of the work that I and many of my colleagues do, is we don't want people who have been through things to be alone. And this comes from very important core concepts that we hold dear. One is the idea of integration, right? That our history doesn't define us, but it's how we carry it, how we make meaning of it. And as we think about integration, the integration of very hard memories along with the beautiful memories that we hold. And what the research has shown is that people who have kind of a coherent narrative tend to do better. This is research with the adult attachment interview, you know, that our ability to kind of have a story of our life. Um, stories aren't always linear, they are thematic in early childhood, I just want to put that out there. But our ability to do that seems to help us to actually change our future. Now, another important concept, and I'm imagining that many of you here know these concepts and are guided by them, but is Selma Freiburg's Ghosts in the Nursery and the newer additions um, by my team, Alicia Lieberman, Bill Harris, and other folks, Angels in the Nursery. And that when we think about these two kind of core guiding theories, Angels in the Nursery reminds us of the importance of helping to preserve moments when children felt incredibly loved or cared for. And that's what I hope the chocolate chip cookies, the rainbow sprinkles are. And Part of the reason for why these moments are so important is because when you hold on to them, what you're holding on to is also the idea of this is a moment when I was loved. And that's where you hold on to the idea of, and that means that I am lovable. And that means that I can also love. And so holding on to these angel moments, and what's interesting is sometimes we lose our stories. Little children lose their stories when they're cared for by multiple people. And we often want to banish the stories because things were really hard. But when we banish the hard stories, we sometimes also banish the good stories because they live in the integration of the waves, if that makes sense. Now, what Selma Freiburg taught us is that history is not destiny. And I actually want to read some of the quotes from her article, Ghosts in the Nursery, because what she taught us is when we think about a child like Ellie, we wouldn't want Ellie to repeat what has happened to her. And I'll go into a little bit of what's happened to her. 
And Selma said, what is it that determines whether the conflicted past of a parent will be repeated with this child? And she said, there are many parents who have themselves lived tormented childhoods who do not inflict their pain upon their children. And these are parents who explicitly or in effect say, I remember what it was like. I remember how afraid I was when. Our hypothesis is that access to childhood pain becomes a powerful deterrent against repetition in parenting, while repression and isolation of affect provides the psychological requirements for identification with the betrayers and aggressors. And what Selma is essentially telling us is that when you can go into and in a way have a story of what happened to you, but have that story be connected to feeling. When you can in essence say, you know, my mama left, my mama was sometimes scary, and it was awful, and it sucked. That somehow being able to connect to the feelings of fear, of anger, of rage, as you metabolize your feelings, as you metabolize your feelings and experience, that actually provides you with a different path forward. That's what Selma Freiberg taught us. And so, in a way, I hate to do this to Ellie, but I wanted to flesh out her story. Now, this is a composite fictional story, but um, so that I could share it in a way that it was videotaped. But all of us, I think we've heard these stories, and let's just think about what Ellie went through, what she needs to hold, and what we need to help her hold. So pregnancy was a very difficult time for Ellie's mom, Daisy. She was separated from her partner, she was depressed, and then, unfortunately, the birth was very difficult. Um, she, things did not go well. Ellie went into the NICU. She was born premature. And then she had numerous medical procedures. Mom, very understandably, was very depressed. Um, and that she had a lot of difficulties. They had a lot of difficulties connecting. In part, because you had a little child who, at birth, had experienced a lot of danger. And Bob Pinus once told me that if you want to understand how trauma, how danger affects a little one, what you need to do is the very nasty thing of shrinking yourself down to their size and walking through the experience at their size. It's not a fun thing to do. But if I think about the NICU procedures that babies go through, what they learn to expect is that when somebody moves towards their bodies, they're gonna move their bodies or do something in a way that might hurt them. Does that make sense? Not, we're, we're doing life-saving things, but to a baby, oh my goodness, you're going to prick, poke me, change me, and, and my body's, I see a lot of head nods, so you guys are just resonating with that. Now, unfortunately, what we know is, so that's the danger. We're acknowledging that the danger is embedding in the baby's body. And very understandably, when Ellie's mom, who wanted to connect with her baby, moved towards her baby, what did the baby do? Flinch, pull away, arch. Does that make sense? Because that's how a baby communicates. And Ellie's mom was not helped in that moment. And the way that she read it is, my baby doesn't love me just like nobody loves me in my life because of what she went through. So very understandably, she was depressed and they were trapped in a cycle. And Ellie had also been intubated, which meant that she had a tube down her throat, you know, a poor little thing. And her mom's task was to feed her, right? And so without love and support, you have a mom who's desperately trying to nurture a baby, who's desperately trying to get away from anything going down their throat, and they have a very difficult start. So when Ellie would cry, Ellie's mom didn't know what to do, in part because the cries were more toxic to her. And there's actually some really interesting research where they put mothers in MRI machines and they had them listen to babies' cries. And babies' cries are supposed to be toxic to our nervous system because that's what gets us activated so that we move towards helping them. But what they found, and you know, they should also study other people other than mothers, but you know, what they found was that when the, for the mothers who had PTSD, their, their neurobiology was activated to a greater degree. And I think that's what happened to Ellie's mom as well. And so she couldn't deal with her baby's cries. And Selma Freiberg has this beautiful line in Ghosts of the Nursery where she says, why can't the parent hear the baby's cries? And I don't know if, you know, in a way, it's almost like, why can't the 
parent feel the baby's cries because it's actually toxic to her, right? And Selma's answer was, in Ghosts in the Nursery, is because nobody's heard her cries, right? And so in order to be able to do that, you otherwise she was stranded in that moment and she was dealing not just with the baby's cries, but with her unheard cries from childhood. So it was like doubly toxic, if that makes sense. And so mom would leave her in the bathroom, which then strands the next generation, just like the previous generation was stranded. And then she would periodically, poof, disappear because she couldn't deal with it. And she would go off, and people would say she was partying, but what I might say is she was numbing out because she just couldn't deal. And that there was ongoing family conflict. And Ellie was with her grandparents, but unfortunately when she was 26 months old, her grandfather had a heart attack and things shifted. Her living situation became unstable. She and mom couched her for a while. Ellie had had Finney in her life because they had lived in the same home for a while, and Finney had to go live with his paternal grandparents. Mom had frequent arguments. Um, I want you to notice that this is a two-year-old, right? And there is no way that she's not affected by this. Can you guys see this? There's no way she wasn't affected as a premature baby in the NICU. There's no way that she's not affected there. And you know, as Matthew said, the large majority of children in the child welfare system are under the age of three. This story is not unusual. So as we recognize this, we know we have to partner to repair harm. And then at 30 months, mom relapsed on pain meds. And she went into the inpatient, and Ellie went with a resource caregiver. At 34 months, there was a significant incident that resulted in Ellie's removal. So I'm just checking my time because, see, I do this thing where I get in front of a group of people and I want to share everything I've learned in the last 30 years. <laughs> so I have way too many slides. So I'm like, oh my god, what can I cover? So this is a, a harder thing, but I wanted to actually share the incident um, that led to Ellie's removal. So. On Halloween, when Ellie was 34 months old, after trick-or-treating, Ellie's mom, Daisy, and some friends decided to have a party. Daisy's friends grabbed Ellie's candy, and they began eating it, I think because they were a little bit high. When Ellie began crying, her mom gave her a pack of Oreos and told her to stay in the room and watch TV, and she put on SpongeBob. Ellie got scared by the thunder and ran to find her mom. Daisy and her friends were drinking and arguing, and the music was loud. Ellie's mom yelled at her, why can't you stay in your room? Get out of here. Now her boyfriend told her not to yell at the kid. Mind your own damn business, she screamed, throwing her beer bottle at him. Glass shattered everywhere near Ellie. Um, her boyfriend grabbed Daisy and pushed her down on the floor, and Ellie shrieked. One of her mom's friends took her to her bedroom and told her to stay there and Ellie crawled in, uh, to, into her bed and hid until she fell asleep. When Ellie woke up, her mom passed out on the floor. She wouldn't wake up. Ellie yelled, Mama, 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 which woke up her mom's friends. They called an ambulance. Daisy had apparently taken pills. She was taken away in an ambulance, and Ellie went with a police officer who had also been called. Okay. Now, I imagine that this story hurts, and I also imagine that this story is very familiar to many of us in this room. Now, what's interesting about this, uh, so, so I just want to say that one of the metaphors I use is that those of us who do this work, we don't necessarily think of ourselves as first responders, but we're like firefighters. Because you see, firefighters go into homes that are in great jeopardy to help families find a pathway out. And we do the same thing. We go into homes, literally, many of us are home visitors, that are in great jeopardy, and we sit there. And we quite literally put ourselves in the middle of the fire so that we can understand it and so that we can find a way out. Now, the thing is, is that firefighters are wise. Do you notice how there's not one firefighter doing this? What they have is a team of firefighters, right? That they know that if you're going to put yourself in this kind of harm, you can't do it alone. And that's something where in our sort of help-serving fields, we've been trying to change this. Because what happens is burnout. And what we have noticed is that you don't want to send your rookies in alone. And you certainly, you want to pair them up with experienced members 
and you want to make sure that they have the skills to navigate the fire. Now, I just want to say that I, as somebody who now is 30 plus years doing trauma work, when I look at this particular scene, I say to, I would be like, wow, that's a lot of great information. I know that's very counterintuitive, but I think to myself, did the family actually trust us with that story? Like, that is brilliant. Because what, if the parent met with us and shared this, they shared moments of deep shame. And then I think about what was that like, them being able to share that with another person, a moment that was not a great moment for them as well, a moment that led to the disruption of their family, because I see healing possibilities. Does that make sense? And if I feel it in my body, I've actually learned to greet the feeling. I know that sounds weird, because what I know is what I'm feeling is what this parent and this child have also been feeling. And that in feeling it, in a way, I'm actually helping them to metabolize their feeling. Because when I hold the feeling and I say, it sounds like it was a really tough time. When I'm with you in that feeling, it's almost like saying this can be spoken, this can be thought about, this can be repaired. It can be repaired not just cognitively, but within relationally and body-wise. And so I see great hope in doing that. But in order to help those people who are newer, who are feeling the heat of this moment, this is why so many of us advocate for really good training and reflective supervision, because otherwise we will have burnout and we will not have providers who are doing this deep work. Now, I also wanted to share with you some of the knowledge and core concepts that I've been fortunate enough to get through you know, my years with the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. And so I've embedded some of their concepts into metaphor. And this is part of a training I do called the ripple effect. But in this picture, there are seven concepts that help us to understand how trauma affects functioning and really what's the mechanism. I call it trauma dynamics, because fluid dynamics is studying the flow of water through a system. And so this is really studying the flow of danger through a system. And what we're going to do is, time permitting, go through three concepts. So one is understanding this idea of an embedded moment, and that's the drop being an embe embedded moment. The ripples are the metaphor for reminders, which is something I'm sure you all are familiar with. And the splash is the metaphor for ruptures in safety and protection. And the first concept, which really comes from Bob Pinus, is that a traumatic experience consists of different moments that are encoded in the brain and body at multiple levels. And I'm going to start with this encoding. And the best way I have of kind of getting us all to get the sense of encoding, which you probably already know, but is a story from NPR. So I was driving in my car, and I heard David Eagleman talking. He's a neuropsychologist. And what he said is that when he was a little boy, he fell from the roof of his house. And that he felt like he was Alice in Wonderland. Because as he was falling, he just imagine time passing really slowly and you can see everything that's happening. And he grew up and he thought, you know, it's so interesting to understand what happens when you're in a life or death moment. And so what he did is he developed a lab where he has research assistants, and he has them free fall, he hooks them up to bungee cords, and he has them free fall from a 15-story building. So it looks like that. And what's interesting is that they fall backwards, because apparently if you fall backwards, which I'm not gonna do, but um, you never really get used to it, and so it's always terrifying. But what he said on NPR is this. It's a trick of memory. Normally, our memories are like sieves, but when you're in our life or death moment, our memories go wide open. That's what memory is for. It's for when everything hits the fan. You want to write it down and remember it. So all of it goes to your hard drive. The clouds, the feeling of the air. Oh, look, there's a guy in a blue shirt. So when you read that back out, the experience feels like it must have taken a very long time. Normally, the trivial stuff gets dumped, but in this situation, it gets written. And then you realize how much trivial stuff there is, which makes you wonder, how do we feel if we remembered all that stuff all the time? You'd be totally consumed by memories. You'd buried. You wouldn't be able to forget it. 
Having an experience like this creates a surfeit of memory, too much to remember. Now, the reason I love this quote is because it's that idea of when you're under a moment of danger, your brain and body open up and say, remember this moment. It's a very different kind of memory than like everyday memory, right? Now, what's interesting is this also happens for little ones in the same way, only they don't always have the ability to put it into words. And we say that caregivers are co-creators of memory, which is as words come online, we tell stories, right? And the stories help you to understand what you went through in your own reactions. But when your stories get lost because they're painful, the reactions stay in your body. Remember, A, acknowledge. Our bodies, B, are designed to remember danger. And if you don't have the cognitive connection, you'll still have the body connection. Right, so then that makes it hard to understand why you're flipping out in this way. And then the second part of this concept is that a traumatic experience consists of different moments that are encoded in the brain and body at multiple levels. Now, if we go back into Ellie's story, I want you to think about how this is, you know, somebody might say there was an incident where this happened, but can you see all the different moments in here? Right, so like there's Halloween, there's trick-or-treating, it's actually a joyful moment that's happening. There's a moment where she's alone in her room having been stuck there and she can hear the noises and the fighting outside. There's a moment of grown-ups yelling and her mom yelling at her. There's a moment of mom throwing a bottle. And there's a moment, again, of her being alone in the room after her mom yelled at her. There's a moment where she finds her mom and her mom won't wake up. Now, each of these, not all of them, are moments of danger, but in these moments of danger after this day, many things associated with day, this day, be, um, many of these things become engraved, embedded in Ellie's body as associated with danger. And that's what takes us to the second concept, which is when a drop falls, there are naturally ripples. And the ripples are a metaphor for reminders and this idea that trauma can generate distressing reminders that can affect a child's life and functioning long after an event has ended. So if you think about Ellie, just take a moment and think about the moments that she went through and think about what might be the reminders for her, okay? So one of the stunning reminders that I heard that a child welfare worker identified for a kiddo was that this kid would get very upset whenever mom drank from green glass bottles, right? Because green glass, so it didn't matter if it was ginger ale because the kid didn't know. What the kid remembered was when you drank green from green glass bottles, all hell would break loose. So they get really amped up. I had a kid who got really upset when people smoked and his mom figured that out. Oh yeah, we used to try and kill each other when we used to smoke. I was like, and she looked at him, she goes, I'm still gonna smoke, but we're not gonna try and kill each other. But you know, these things remind kids of danger. Bedtime could end up being a reminder for her. Halloween, every year you've got a cyclical reminder of that day. Anger, if you think about even the idea of people are starting to get angry, what does that do to my body? People drinking, um, Oreos, right? Like she could have a very strange reaction when she gets Oreos somewhere. We would think it's a treat and she might just get ripped back to that day. And we often think about like there's an ambulance, that there's a siren. What we often don't think about is the siren inside your body. So that day when she was sitting there, what was happening inside her body? And that your body-based cues can sometimes transport you, make you time travel back to moments at other times when your body was doing that thing. And then, of course, adults sleeping. There are many more things. But does this make sense in a way? Now, the reason I'm sharing this is that oftentimes in systems of care, we don't get Ellie's history. We don't, and or one person has Ellie's history, and we don't have the ability to share it because of laws or because of confidentiality. And what I would typically say is that when we're documenting or when parents are sharing, we're not sharing for removal, we're sharing for healing. Because when somebody who is caring for Ellie knows her history and starts to learn that, ooh, this is a kid where this is a challenge for her, 
if we can share that information, we can help LA feel safer in other places. Does that make sense to you all? So for example, anybody who's ever known a kid who's been bitten by a dog, when you take your kid somewhere, you often tell them he was bitten by a dog, he might be scared by dogs. Does that make sense? And what that allows is every other caregiver taking care of that kid, they can keep an eye out when there's a dog and they can be like, hey, why don't you come hang out with me? That's actually attachment. That's being a secure base to somebody, right? In the presence of danger, a grown-up has got you. Well, Ellie's been bitten by anger. And if we don't talk about this, we strand her alone with it. So in the presence of danger, her nervous system is flying and other people are looking at her like, what's wrong with you? So this is something where we can do things better. And one of the metaphors I like to use is that people will say to me, can you cure, can you fix the kid? And what I would often say is, I think with trauma you've got the wrong metaphor because it's more like asthma. And what you know is that you don't fix or cure asthma, you manage it. And that one of the ways you do that is by looking at the environment and thinking about trying to remove those things that cause the asthma attack. And so reminders are like pollen. And so often, if like ho at Halloween time, it would be understandable that Ellie would have a return of anxiety or symptoms. And it's not anxiety. It's really trauma-related expectations. It's her body remembering. A, acknowledge that the body remembers. And when you make the connection, you can more rapidly help a kid return to safety. Does that make sense? Now, as we think about reminders, it's also important to think about how reminders connect. That it would be very reasonable for Ellie to think about, you know, my mom's not here, I wonder where she is. There were times that she wasn't okay. Maybe she's not okay now. There are times when she was scary. And does she even care? And so that's a lot for a three-year-old to be caring. And certainly it's a lot for her to be caring alone. So we wanna change this. And some of the concepts that we might hold, these are common developmental themes from child-parent psychotherapy, is we might, you know, our work is rooted in these concepts and that knowing it helps us to do a better job. That little kids blame themselves when their parent is angry or upset or when something goes wrong, right? And that babies and children remember. They have a well-developed, they have well-developed memories from an early age and their capacity to remember precedes their capacity to speak about their memories. It's really fascinating to see somebody who has gone through something before the age of 12 months and as language and play and other symbolic representation comes online, we actually see them showing us stuff that they went through when they were little. We had a 15 month old who kept cramming a baby doll under a crib. And when the parents saw it, they said, oh my God, that's where he would f hide when we fight. So how can we honor that you know, they know this and that memory is particularly vivid for events that evoke strong emotions such as joy, anger, or fear. And that the memories may not be completely accurate because they're influenced by the child's affective state and cognitive level, including their understanding of cause-effect relationships. Okay. So as we see this, I mean, and I'm, hopefully you guys are still with me, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm sharing all these concepts that I found super helpful. But one of the concepts is that not all moments are equal. That there seems to be some moments that are sticky, that stick in people, that embed more than other moments. And these are linked to what Alicia calls um, the universal fears. And this is coming to us from Freud and Winnicott. And I want, I, I, it's helpful for me to think of them as evolutionarily wise fears that we all have because they're what kept our species alive. Does that make sense? So the first fear that comes up when you're a baby is fear of not being seen. Am I seen? Am I felt? Am I responded to? And think about how if you are a baby and you are not seen, you are not alive. So it's a very wise fear, this idea of do you respond to me when I cry? And the next fear that comes in as mobility comes in is the fear of, of, lo of loss, fear of separation. You know, you are you, I am me, as I'm starting to learn that, will you leave me? What will happen to me when you're not with me? And then fear of losing love, am I acceptable? Fear of body damage, is my body safe? And that is such a wise fear, because back in the day, 
You know, if you think about fear of body damage, like when they x-ray mummies, you know, in Egypt, and you say, what did they die of? Oh, they died of a broken leg, right? So it's so wise that within our body, we have a fear of separation, because if you wander off, back in the day, you would be dead. And if you hurt your body back in the day, you would be dead. So I mean, it's, it's sort of like, so it's really good and smart to be afraid of these things because they're not good for us, right? And, and then the other one is fear of being bad. So as you go out into the world, will I be cast out? Will I be acceptable? Now, as you listen to this, I want us to think about when we really know the experiences of the children and the adults that we partner with, for a lot of them, there's this universal fear that we all have, and there's the intersection of that with lived experience. And what we see is actually there's an overlap. And when you see that somebody has had an experience where it's not a fear, it's a reality, those tend to be the things that stick. Does that make sense? So we tend to see little kids who've had broken bones early on, actually like break the, the like Play-Doh figures in the same places and they shouldn't be able to remember that it happened. But body damage is one of those things that you remember. So and then of course, just there's the contribution of fantasy, right? That little children also, they fill in the gaps when they don't have a grown up talking to them with a combination of reality and fantasy. Now, the third concept here is this idea of a splash, right? When a drop falls, it breaks the silence of the water. And that metaphor is that trauma can rupture spoken and unspoken social contracts. And in early childhood, one of the important social contracts, if you look on the right, and, and the, the monster there is just supposed to be a representation of danger, but little children are supposed to believe that when there is danger, your grown-up will keep you safe no matter what. That is what we call the idea of the protective shield, that your grown-up is all-powerful no matter what you've got me. Now, that of course is not true, but they do believe that we're all-powerful, right? And I always jokingly say that my son, um, when he was two years old, he's now 21, but when he was two years old, he believed it was my fault when it rained on his birthday because <laughs> I was all-powerful, right? And that is beautiful and funny. The thing is, if something bad had happened to him, guess what? Would have been my fault. Even if it wasn't my fault, that would have damaged the, the sense of protection that he would have. And it's that, from that sense of protection, that's actually Bowlby's attachment theory, that because you've got me, I can wander out in the world. Because I know that if there's danger, you've got me. And if I don't, what I have is I have fear without connection and protection. Now, one of the things that we think about is, what if the source of my love is also the source of my fear? What if is in Ellie's case? And that's something that Arietta Slade has talked about, right? When the object of your love is the object of your fear, then I have a very difficult dilemma, especially if you're not talking about what happened. How might we help repair that rupture? And so as we think about ruptures and protection, we might think about were families involved in the harm and afterwards, how did they respond? Did they acknowledge? Did the child feared care for? And so I wanted to read you another story, thinking about how we support caregivers and loved ones in repairing ruptures. And of course, Ellie's mom, it's more than the separation, but this particular story addresses sep ruptures caused by separations. Little Rabbit sighed a deep sigh and said, when you weren't with me, I missed you so much. I missed you too, responded Big Rabbit tenderly. I thought about you every day. I wanted you to hold me, said Little Rabbit. I wanted to hug you and never let you go, sighed Big Rabbit. But you weren't there, whispered Little Rabbit. Big Rabbit took a deep breath and replied, I'm so sorry I wasn't with you. We are together now. Little Rabbit thought for a while and finally spoke. Yes, but. Sometimes I'm very mad. I don't understand why you weren't with me. I worry you'll go away again. My tummy hurts. I don't trust you. I feel scared. When I'm upset, I need you, but then I get mad and I push you away. I don't know what to do. Big Rabbit listened carefully and then softly said, I'm very sorry and very sad that this happened. 
I wasn't with you and you didn't understand why. You probably felt confused, scared, hurt, sad, angry. You probably felt so alone. I did, exclaimed Little Rabbit. I felt so alone, confused, hurt, sad, scared, angry. I didn't know where you were. Where were you? asked Little Rabbit. Big Rabbit remembered and then shared from the heart. I wasn't with you, but I was thinking about you all the time. I hoped and planned and dreamed and worked so I could get back to you because you were so important and I love you so much. It took a long time, said Little Rabbit softly. Too long, agreed Big Rabbit. I don't know what it was like for you when I wasn't there, Big Rabbit added, but I want to know. I want to know what you did. I want to know if there were good people who helped you. I want to know if bad or scary things happened too. I want to give you all the hugs and kisses that I couldn't give you then. I wasn't with you then, said Big Rabbit, but I am here now. Little Rabbit and Big Rabbit were quite close now. They looked into each other's eyes and then said, we are together again after so long. So again, you can see the triangle, all the reactions of Little Rabbit, completely understandable when you hold how much this Little Rabbit was affected by this separation. And we can think together about what Big Rabbit does that is so beautiful in helping Little Rabbit. And it's actually quite simple, right? What Big Rabbit starts off with is an acknowledgement, right? Big Rabbit says, Big Rabbit listens, and Big Rabbit opens the door to feeling. Remember, people who connect feelings to experience are less likely to repeat. But it can often be in very simple ways. And Big Rabbit opens the door to story. You don't have to be alone with this. We could also talk about what it was like when I was there and I was not in my best space. That's some of the work that we do. Now, in our field of my field of mental health, um, we as grown-ups, we like to pitch to kids. I'm using a baseball metaphor. And when I say pitch, we like to teach you the way to behave. We like to show you the rules. We like to show you the way to behave. Um, you know, but one of the things, that when a kid has a story inside, one of the metaphors that I like to think is, when do we as grown-ups need to be catchers? And that's what Big Rabbit is doing, is Big Rabbit is saying, I don't know what things were like for you, but I want to know. And when you say something like that, many kids, they don't just turn around and say, oh yeah, thank you, Chandra, for bringing this up. I'd like to share this with my parent right now. You know, it's not that easy. You have to really sit down there and be like, okay, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. This is hard on my thighs, but I'm waiting. <laughs> you know, it's hard on my gut, but I'm waiting. And then you know what? Little kids will actually, they'll pitch to you. And if you catch it and you say, oh, that was it, then they might go off and do something else. But little by little, they learn that you're really there to catch it. And as you're there to catch it, as Ellie's mom is there to catch it, they tell you more and more. Does that make sense? And then what you often hear is that mixture of reality of, oh my God, you do remember that day in the Oreo cookies, and oh my God, and fantasy. You thought I left because of this? You thought that? Oh, that was so not. And that fantasy is often causing harm. But if we're constantly pitching, we don't hear the fantasy. We don't hear all of their beliefs about why this happened. So it's so critical that we're able to open the door as grown-ups. And I'm, I want to really note that I'm, I am a mental health provider and a therapist, but Alicia says you don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic. And I want you to really hold all of this stuff that's happening with Ellie, uh, with Miss Kay, with Finney, with her mom when her mom comes back in. Those are the folks who are catching this. And my role is to support them in doing that catching because it's hard to catch stories of your own guilt and shame. And so as we think about this and we think about people like Ellie's mom and like Big Rabbit, and we th what might help them to be able to hold their children, if that's the goal, is for a grown-up to hold their child's emotional experience for that repair to happen, what might help them? And I just want to bring Jeree Paul into this space. Because what she taught us, one of the core concepts of infant mental health, that parallel process, do unto others as you would have others 
do unto others. And so if I want Ellie's mom to hold Ellie's emotional experience, I need to hold her emotional experience. So I need to be a good catcher. I need to partner with parents and support them so that they can support their children better. That's the parallel process that our field is built on. And so I need to sit there and think about how could I earn the right to hear mom's story? How might she trust me? I can notice all the problems that are really irritating to me because it hurts me when Ellie prepares for a visit and it doesn't happen. But I also want to know what's going on for mom. And she's dealing with big waves and would she trust me to talk about her big waves and where they come from and how they affect her and how she feels and her guilt and shame. And then I also really want to consider the splash, right? Because when I talked earlier about the splash, I was focusing on the splash between Ellie and her mom, between the family and the mom. But as we do this, we want to broaden our lens and think about where are the ruptures in safety happening. So as our field has moved towards trauma-informed systems, a lot of people have been focusing on ACEs, on adverse childhood experiences. And this is Bronfenbrenner's model. And I just want us to notice that every single ACE is located in the layer of the family. It's family to child. Does that make sense? And when we broaden our lens, what we might say is, are we also, A, acknowledging what we might call adverse um, community experiences? Things like poverty, things like racism, things like the way that families are separated because of their national origin or race or ethnicity. Those things are also harming families. And are we also thinking about what Marquita and I call the atrocious cultural experiences, which are the original ACEs, and have those been acknowledged? So if we're asking families to acknowledge the adverse childhood experiences as a system, are we also acknowledging that historical reality? And that historical reality is this, is that bef you know, what gave rise to the ACEs is often adverse you know, systemic oppression that is current and atrocious cultural experiences like genocide, slavery, colonization, the denial of basic human rights, removal of property, forced family separations, and any time that a parent could not protect their child from society. So they had to develop alternate ways. Now, these are hard things for us to think about, but in our systems, and we, as we think about ruptures that need to be repaired and ruptures that need to be acknowledged, for many families, the roots of their problems came from things that happened to them within our society. And how is that acknowledged as we do this work? Whether the system or society was involved in harm afterwards, how have we responded? Have we acknowledged this? And does that cultural group feel cared for, protected, buffered? by the work that we're doing in partnership with them. Okay, so these are things that we need to do. These are things that we have not always traditionally done. And so I wanted to offer this quote from Maya Angelou, which is, I did then what I knew how to do, and now that I know better, I do better. And what this means is how are we integrating a focus on historical and sociocultural trauma? Now, I, I want to remind us that our beliefs or our attributions affect the signals that we send each other. And when I hold, even in my body, the idea that you are not problematic, you have been through things as a people, as a cultural group, that, that we're not OK, that our society, and that my work is the work not of fixing, but it's the work of repairing, repairing harms. I shift my body and my way of being with you. And so I find that really important. So I just wanted to highlight a little bit of hope as we end for today. Our work matters. And just this week, we had a study published that shows that actually our work can change bodies. And so I, you know, this is an incredible finding, Nikki Bush and her team, that showed that a psychosocial treatment can affect biological outcomes. And I want to just quickly walk you through this infographic. Because what we know is that 
when you have had difficult experiences like trauma, it can affect you at a cellular level. And so what they studied was cellular aging, because we know that trauma can accelerate normal cellular aging processes. Our, our cells are always aging, but they age more rapidly when you've been through difficult things. And that cellular aging is associated with health problems. That's the ACE you know, underlying the ACE study. Adverse childhood experiences can affect your health because it can affect you at a cellular level. And so what happened was they took a group of, so they, they had matched samples of children. One group received child-parent psychotherapy. The other that were matched on all kinds of variables did not. And they looked at their cellular aging. And what they found is that at intake, the groups did not differ with regards to cellular aging but that at post-test, the children who received child-parent psychotherapy had lower rates of cellular aging compared to the other, tr the other group of kids who did not get treatment. And what this suggests is that children who receive intervention, they might be at lower risk for health problems later on. And that suggests what we, we are all here for. We are here to invest early for better health, emotional health, physical health and relational health, and that we know that treating early childhood now, it heals now and it has the potential to improve physical health later. So what we do, this deep work that we do, absolutely matters and would absolutely save money. So it is the smart thing that we're here to do. So let me just wrap this up with a little children's story. Um, and, and let me just say, I have the time to share this. Um, I was working with a grandmother who identifies as black, and in my work, I have to explain to people why I think that talking about stress and trauma is really good. And she looked at me and she said, we don't do that kind of thing, not in my culture. And she looked at me and she goes, and not with people who are outside of our family. And I took a deep breath, because I knew better than to contradict my elders, I was raised properly. <laughs> and I thought about it, and I said, you know, you're right. We don't do that. Because I thought about, I'm half East Indian and half Japanese, and that was not a typical thing to do either. And, and then I was in a playroom, and I said, you know, I think most of us, I know this is weird, but you know, I think people who work with me get used to me being weird. But I said, um, I, I grabbed a little cooking pot. And I said, I think most of us, we've been taught to lit it. And she looked at me and she went, uh-huh. And I said, the problem is, is that when the heat is on high and the lid is on tight, we pay for it in our bodies. And the minute I said that, she did what many of your heads are doing, like, uh-huh. And I said, we pay for it here. And, then, and, and she started pointing to her body. Right? And, and, that, and that's the ACE study. And I said, and what we're trying to do with your grandson is to turn down the heat. And you've done that because you've gotten him safer. And then we're trying to help him lift the lid so all of that is not inside. Does that make sense? And I said, and he doesn't have to do it with me, but kids sometimes share their experiences in, with toys in ways that are, they can't say it with words, but they show us. And so I kind of speak that language. So if you would want you know, me helping and you helping me, we could do that. And she was like, that sounds good. And that day she began treatment. Well, I just want to say that I've often thought about, we do lit it. And then why is it that we lit it, right? And what I want to say is, I think my answer is, because our ancestors were wise. Because if we hadn't lit it, we wouldn't have survived. Does that make sense? Like, my dad grew up under British rule in colonial India. It would not have been safe to be popping off at the mouth all the time, although he did it quite a bit in his home, but not safe outside in the world. Okay, and so you learned not to talk about it because you wanted the next generation to survive. But if, we often say this is my culture, and what I might push back on is I might say, it might have been the way that a cultural group survived an oppressive situation. But we might be able to rewrite our stories, and we might be able to change things. 
and that's what this story is for. Good day, my name's Mr. Holden Pot, and I was taught that you got what you got. And when the heat is turned on hot, do not let it show. Because all those feelings that start to bubble, they will surely cause you trouble unless your lid is on real tight and you hold it on with all your might. Sadness, anger, I keep them inside. Along with tears, I never cried. At times, I think I'll overflow, but that's my way. It's what I know. Little Pot watched and tried to be brave. Little Pot listened and tried to behave. But there were so many things Little Pot never told, too many things for a Little Pot to hold, all by himself, pushed off a shelf, called dirty and dented by others who meant it. And all this made the stew thicken, lid quake and heartbeat quicken, body ache and belly sicken. Little Pot could not know what to do, so do you know what he did? He blew. Then Little Pot felt ashamed and afraid. He'd be in big trouble for the mess that he made. But this time was different, for when he blew, Holden Pot saw him and Holden Pot knew. The rumbling volcano he'd learned to contain, he'd held for too long, that feeling of pain. So he went quickly, took Little Pot by the hand, held him real tight, and said, I understand, you're feeling alone, you're burning inside, but I am right here, I'm right by your side. And if you are hurting and needing to scream, let's open your lid and let off some steam. Let's turn down the heat so you don't feel so pot hot, for you are my precious, my love little pot. And in the warmth of Holden's love and embrace, tears started dripping down little pot's face. Little pot felt so loved and was now not alone, for in Holden pot's arms, he found safety and home. Now, the other pots watched and knew it is true that pots who tease need Holden too. So all of us big pots, we know what to do. I wanted to thank you all for everything that you do on behalf of children and families and for being big pots who are helping to break intergenerational cycles and to help restore and repair and bring love back together. Thank you. <laughs>